Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 322. Oh, what type of edition is this? Well, it's going to be the Tuesday morning edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Kevin Ashland, and it's the 12th of September, and for me, it's a slightly dangerous edition. Okay, let's give some quick updates here before we get to the news. First, we want you to like and share Anglican Unscripted with all your friends. Uh, for the clergy people, you need to share it with the laity. Don't be afraid that they know the news. Don't no, do not do that. And we also need you to donate this week. I'm going to be traveling to the uh, Anglican Continuing Synod uh, in October. Uh, it's basically several of the... Uh, uh, continuing Anglican churches uh, are getting together and having a joint synod, and they're going to sign a joint statement of uh, full communion with, with each other. It's going to be very historic, and uh, I need to be there. So if you could go to anglican.inc forward slash donate, uh, press the donate button and help uh, me travel without writing it from the Coulson checkbook. Uh, people have been asking me left and right, how is George? George is fine. He survived the hurricane. Uh, most of Florida survived the hurricane. Obviously, lots of damage, but uh, very little death, which is, you know, an answer to prayer. For all those people who didn't know, uh, your prayers are answered. The, the track of the hurricane moved. Uh, mm -hmm. If you prayed for the safety of your relatives and family down there, it worked. You need to get on your knees and, and, and praise God for answered prayer. A lot of times we forget to do that after these types of events. Um, Gavin, you're back from Russia. You had the vodka. How are you feeling? <clears throat> well, um, it, 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 <laughs> I should have drunk more vodka, Gavin, because, <laughs> because um, uh, I, I've experienced a, a, a Russian parasite called E. coli <laughs> no. or something similar. Sure, yeah. And, and uh, I went to my pharmacist yesterday saying, can I just talk talk you through this? And she said, get to the doctors now. Anyway, um, I, I don't spend, um, I, I never travel very, more than about 50 yards from the washroom at the moment. And um, I'm trying to work out how to get across country for the next two or three days. And I think I've got to do it by train because it's the only way. It's the only way to, that there's going to be, yes. Uh, it's so only it's a car way. Wow. <laughs> exactly. Um, and and uh, however, this is what mortality and, and uh, mortality of the flesh is like. So um, you have to pay a small price. I mean, I'm just so grateful I haven't been in a hurricane. And I, yeah, I'm sure. grateful it's just embarrassment and discomfort. Well, we do pray that you get well. And uh, um, yeah, that's the worst thing about traveling. I remember we here in, in Connecticut, in, my, in the town I am, there's a travel clinic. So before I go to Africa or, you know, the Congo or Uganda, I go in there and I, I tell my doctor, uh, here's where I'm going. And she goes, well, let's make sure your shots are up to date and stuff like that. And then she'll go again and said, listen, this is a, you know, this place has bacterial issues or she'll list the, the diseases that are common and says, no matter what, if you're going to brush your teeth, you use bottled water. <gasps> oh, I almost forgot to, you know, and she would go through all these things. I, I, I I wished I'd spoken to you before I went. That's such a sensible thing to do. Yeah. And of course, I didn't do it. No. Um, but there we are. Yeah, I mean, and I'm sure that's a lot of times, you know, people who are careful, they don't eat the fruit, they, they avoid all the things that, you know, it's common knowledge. Boom, one little thing, and that, you know, they're, <clears throat> they're visiting Montezuma's Revenge. Okay, on to the news. Uh, here in America, in the States, we've been uh, taken up by two hurricanes. So I've not been watching a lot of the BBC um, and other European news a lot lately. I did get wind of a story about uh, a transgendered six-year-old who shows up at his Christian school and announces he's a boy, but now he's a girl, whatever. However that works. And now that's starting to make the news and there's some parents who are concerned What's the update on the story? So the facts of you described them uh, are right, except I don't think I'd call it a Christian school. I'd, I'd call it a Church of England school, and, and I'm not being catty. No, you're not. I, I mean, that, I, you know, when you think about it, that's right. You know, it's a, oh boy. Uh, because, because actually that's the issue. Do you know, Kevin, just as a bit of background, one of the things 
I've never understood. And uh, I, I remember asking the man who's now Dean of Westminster Abbey, who was in charge of our education department once, why it was the Church of England had been so lame in its in its use of, of its schools. Because, as I'm sure you know, one of the things that's happened in Europe, and particularly in England, is the state has taken over from the church all the things the church did. All the acts of compassion, all the humanitarian work the church did have now been taken over by the state and particularly with schools. So after the Second World War, a compromise was made whereby the, the state funded the schools that the church owned, but the church nonetheless owned them. And so there were some quite useful pieces of legislation which allowed, if that required, the church and other people to do acts of worship. Now, um, it's easy to be wise after the event, but I've never understood why the Church of England didn't put all of its resources into Christianizing its schools, yeah. uh, to have Christian staff, Christian headmasters, of course, making everybody welcome, but saying, um, if you want the kind of values that we stand for, come to us. In, in fact, as far as I, in my own experience, there is no difference at all uh, in church, between Church of England schools and secular schools, except perhaps the Church of England ones wore uniforms more often than not. Well, and, the, and, and this seems to me to be a huge waste. Yeah, the Church of England schools produced some of the most vocal, famous atheists uh, of modern time. Uh, you know, the people who go, go around and have speaking tours well, where did you go to, to, to school? Uh, you know, Church of England School. Oh, no. And you're just like, you know, uh, you're producing the wrong ones by trying to hide the truth. Well, uh, and, and the chickens have come home to roost now because um, at, least, at least the Catholics um, were much more overt in the kind of Catholic culture of the school. You, you would be aware you were in a Catholic school, although they too have had problems in terms of the way they've sold out to the culture. But if we come to this particular case, we have two Christians who are, who are faithful Christians and they have a, a child who's six. And you might have thought that six was too young to be overwhelmed by the, um, the, by the cultural hurricane that is affecting our education system. But one of their classmates would come in one day as a boy and the next day as a girl and then revert again as a boy and then come back as a girl. And the teachers would say, well, you have to treat this six-year-old uh, as whatever gender it chooses. I, I can't think of many decisions I would have wanted my children to take responsibility for when they were six, not even mealtimes and certainly not bedtimes. But the idea that they could take responsibility for their gender seems to me to be actually a complete evacuation of adult responsibility. Uh, well, the, the two Christians in this, in this case who are called Nigel and Sally Rowe decided they wanted to make a stand about this. At the moment, the, the social media is divided as to whether or not the best response would have been to humor, uh, to love, to make space for whatever uh, fluctuations of gender consciousness this poor six-year-old was having, or whether they should have held the Church of England to account for, in this particular case, they feel discriminating against their children and all the other children in the class in favour of this confused child. Uh, well, I guess all of us can make up our mind about, you know, when we take a stand and when we don't. Interestingly enough, the Diocese of Portsmouth um, defended the experiment in transgenderism, saying they were bound by the 2010 Equalities Act and they had to make a safe space for this one child. There is no sense that under the Act they had responsibilities to the other children. And that, of course, is, is the, the legal issue that this couple are trying to pursue. So, um, as you and I were saying uh, uh, slightly early on before we came on air, this really is a lose-lose situation. It's very hard to see what, what good can possibly come out of this conflict, um, except that we're in a, a meltdown of, of ethical standards uh, and, and personal identity. We are. I mean, personal identity is now bound in victimhood. Uh, and when you ascribe yourself as a victim, there's no other way out as a victim except to beget more victims and identify people as victims. And, and it's just this, this ball rolling down a hill effect where um, at some point everybody is a victim and there's no solution. Well, you and I know what the solution is. 
um, and, and who the solution is. Um, but the reality is the school is going to lose its way in this. Uh, the teacher is going to be frustrated. The uh, Obviously, the administration is, is frustrated because um, while we kind of understand there is, you know, some basics to fluid genderism, um, does it belong as a social experiment in our schools? Um, and do we not try to find this person help? Uh, I have a, uh, we have a grocery store here in Milford and the um, gentleman who dresses as a, uh, a female every day, uh, he's the cashier who checks out your thing. Uh, I make sure that I uh, address him with his uh, uh, birth pronoun because I may be the only person who's ever really told him he's a man. Um, and I feel that's my responsibility. He's gotten used to it. He sees me coming. He knows that, you know, this is going to be a thing. And he doesn't make a big thing of it because um, he knows, I think, what I'm trying to do. Not to embarrass him, uh, but to, to let him know that he truly is a man. And um, so far, I've not been arrested. But <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget taking communion from... Uh, there was a period of my of, of my life when I was very strongly in favor of LGBT issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I discovered I'd been reading the Bible wrong and I was spiritually mistaken and so I changed my mind. But in those days I used to occasionally visit the Metropolitan Community Church, where churches where gay people go. And I've never forgotten um, uh, the very fond feeling I had for a man, a very big man, about six foot four, uh, dressed as a woman with lots of mascara on, and he hadn't taken the trouble to shave properly until the bristle was growing through the mascara and uh, and he was he was offering communion and i remember feeling a great wave of affection for him uh, i kept, i wanted to put my arm around him and protect him and, and and look after him however the problem that we have is not one of compassion for individuals uh, it's that we're engaged in a philosophical debate uh, which has to do with postmodernism and what we've been calling cultural Marxism. And the point about the victim is the victim is the jemmy or the lever that's being used to overturn all the, the flagstones or the sidewalk of, of Judeo-Christian ethics, which is why uh, it's always one kind of victim rather than another. So in this particular case, the society will choose to see the six-year-old transgendered confused child as a victim and won't see any of the other children whose education is being disrupted and who are finding the fact they have no handholds about their own identity uh, threatened. Um, the same is true when, when it comes to paedophilia. It's very interesting that one of the things that, that many of us have been talking about is this, this cultural Marxist train which, which began with the carriage of feminism and then, and then moved on to gay marriage and then became transgenderism. And some of us have been saying, what next? You know, what, what victim rabbit is going to be pulled out of the bag to overturn Christian ethics? And many people are saying it's paedophilia. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the, the next thing on the news has been uh, a program called Victoria Live, which the BBC run. And they produced a professor uh, whose name is Derek Perkins. And one of the things he's been saying, and it's, it's not untrue, but it's the direction of travel that's so alarming, is that the paedophiles are victims of mental illness uh, and they can't uh, help themselves uh, and they must be pitied rather than morally censured. Um, that's okay but we have two victims again here. We have the children whose lives are destroyed perhaps forever <clears throat> by the experience of a predatory adult who apparently can't help himself right. and yeah. now the adults become a victim. We might, we might use the analogy for example of an alcoholic who drives a car and drunk kills people or maims them for life. If the, if the BBC or the public media said, oh my goodness, this person at the wheel of the car is a victim of their alcoholism, we can't hold them responsible for getting behind a car and driving it, killing people, because they had no choice. Um, of course, the fact is there is always an element of choice in moral issues. It's sometimes it's hard to identify where it lies, but by use of this notion of the victim of only certain kinds of people, uh, the intention is to upend Judeo-Christian ethics which which root themselves in objective standards that hold us mainly safe and allow us to know where we are. 
Yeah, it, there's no greater example of where a victimhood would beget victimhood than uh, pedophilia. Um, but here's where the BBC and all all the mass media press is going to run into a problem: is they're going to you know, promote and and you know make good uh, pedophilia uh, up until the point where they have uh, priests who have suffered from this. And mm. that's when oh well you know and then they run into their, their own little paradox of uh, uh, ideology. Uh, they will never ever 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 support or call a priest a victim. So, <sighs> so what we have what we have at the moment is we have fluid ethics. Yes, we don't just have fluid personality. <laughs> we have fluid ethics. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know it's 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 certainly true that that under uh, under the traditions of scripture and the Judeo-Christian ethics that our society has been built on in many ways very successfully. It's certainly true there were failures and mistakes. Of course there are, we're human beings. But nonetheless, this extraordinary um, edifice of morality that comes starts with the, with the, with the Ten Commandments uh, and has glued our society together is being rapidly unglued. And whilst I understand the point of view of people who say that when it comes to this school in Portsmouth in England, maybe the Christian parents should just have rubbed along a little bit. Uh, you can also understand that, that for a number of Christians, as they see everything we believe in going down the tube, saying there must be a point where I personally stand up for Christ, where I stand up for revelation, where I stand up for the authority of the word, where I stand up for my allegiance uh, to, to my discipleship. Um, none of us know at what point we're going to find ourselves caught with a position of principle. But I think, uh, I, I think, uh, however, however this particular couple come across in public, I want to respect and to recognize the fact that they at least are standing up for a, a matter of principle. And maybe if more Christians across our confused culture were willing to stand up at, at critical moments, we might be able to slow this thing down more than we've done so far. Oh, amen. I mean, suppose nobody ever told this little six-year-old boy that he's he's a boy. You know, suppose you know that uh, word has not gotten out to him because of bad parenting, uh, the society we live in, and the fluidness of our stupidity. Yeah, but, but what I, he's been told is yeah. What what he's been told is the reality is whatever he feels it is. And, and, and this, you know, my guess is this is not really about gender at all. It's expressing itself through gender. Uh, but, but really, the, it's, a, it's a much greater problem. The idea that in our society, we can make the world and make ourselves whatever we want. It's a kind of idolatry, a sort of form of narcissism. That, and that's the great danger. And of course, the problem is that, that this poor child will come up against a number of things that, that don't give way to his wishful thinking. And in that sense, of course, it's very bad parenting. Very bad parenting. Gavin, 17 minutes. You are my hero. You you did it. You did you no know, running to the bathroom. You held on. I, and can, <laughs> I can feel the board and threshold, appro threshold approaching. And, uh, and uh, I, it's, it's hugely nice for me. I haven't had to rush away from the camera and say, I'll be back. Hit the pause button. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been listening to episode 322 of Anglican Unscripted, and I'm off now for a short break.